Hey, good afternoon, everyone. I hope uh, everybody can hear me. Uh, we're going to get started. Uh, uh, so first, I'd like to welcome everyone to Wake Up to Wellness 2018 and the second day of our series of presentations uh, for this weekend. Uh, we had the opportunity yesterday to listen to some uh, really important good presentations, and we're going to continue that today. Uh, before we get started, just some administrative things. Um, outside, uh, there is uh, bathrooms, there's water, there's uh, response cards that you should receive some of them when you came in. Uh, so if you do have any questions uh, that uh, you may not feel comfortable asking uh, throughout the presentation, feel free to write them down. The presenters will get back to you. Uh, it's also an opportunity to ask us if, the, if there's any uh, information that we would like. Uh, or to get in touch with someone from the organization, please uh, leave the information and they will do that for you. Um, also, there's pens available outside too, so if you need anything, if you, if you forgot to just ask outside more of the folks there, we'll be able to get something for you. Um, also, uh, the event this, uh, this weekend, the series of presentations to wake up to Wellness 2018, is sponsored by the Seventh-day Adventist Reform Movement. Uh, the Seventh-day Adventist Reform Movement is um, a registered charity in Canada. That's why there is no cost to this. We believe that it is our duty to share this type of information uh, on health, and good health with others. And uh, overall, as an organization, we are interested in both spiritual and physical health. So that's what we want to share uh, with uh, everyone here this weekend. Uh, so today, um, I'm not going to spend too much time talking so we can get started, but I want to introduce uh, Dr. Ophelia Gaman, uh, who is here with us. Uh, she is a board-certified uh, physician uh, that's currently practicing in and around Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, so very happy to have, your, have her here with us. And um, uh, Dr. Ophelia is, uh, has a special interest in preventative med med medicine, and I think that's something that all of us need to be interested in. Right? That is, we don't want to get sick and then start suddenly worry, be worried about our health. Right? We want to prevent ourselves from being sick. And really that's what we want to learn this week. How can we prevent ourselves from getting sick? If we are sick, what can we do now to help ourselves to get better? Because ultimately we all want to have long and healthy lives. Uh, so yesterday we had the opportunity to listen to Dr. Felia speak about uh, probiotics and intestinal health with uh, special insights to what affects our gut, which is really, as we learned, our second brain really has on our overall health. And today, as you can see, she'll be speaking about the uh, causes and treatments for chronic pain. So with that, we'll pass it over to Dr. Ophelia. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. It's a pleasure again to see you. Um, I'm happy to be among you. Um, like Joseph said, I come from Atlanta, Georgia. I'm a family physician, and not only am I passionate about um, preventative medicine, but I'm truly passionate about integrative medicine. How can we integrate current scientific models with the old school natural treatments, and how can we combine them in a very organized fashion and support our healing bodies when needed. So today I chose the topic of chronic pain, um, which seems to be a painful topic to talk about. Um, but honestly, how many of us in this room have experienced pain at least once in their lifetime? So it is a topic that pretty much touches each and every one of us on an almost daily basis. And so, even though most of us don't like the idea of having pain, not having pain, or not having the ability to feel pain is also not so good, like we will see soon. But pain is so disruptive to our daily routine, and most of us wake up and need to get to work, and they don't have, we don't have time to stop for a headache. We don't have time to deal with it, so what do we do? We pop a pill. Well, my goal today is to hopefully not, hopefully to encourage you to explore and to get to know your body and why you are having pain and hopefully give you some insight on some of the reasons that could cause your pain. So today I'll be talking about chronic pain, which is defined by 
Duration of pain beyond three months. Chronic pain can be caused by multiple factors and the treatment is quite complex. So how many Canadians live with chronic pain? In 2011, it was about 18.9%. And in 2018, it was about 19%. So the statistics is pretty um, consistent. 50% uh, of Canadians have had uh, this chronic pain for more than 10 years. And 33% of these patients reported that their pain was disabling. And when your pain is disabling, when you can't get up out of bed, or if you have to give up on your hobbies and your life, it's quite, quite um, discouraging. So in the U.S., um, the prevalence is a little um, higher, but um, our population is also a bit larger. Um, but let's go ahead and continue. Now this is an example of an acute type of pain. So you're by the stove, you're boiling some water, and you accidentally touch the hot pan or stick your hand in this boiling water. Uh, immediately, your nerves, nerve fibers on your finger endings, uh, uh, sense the danger. Uh, it all, all of a sudden activates your nerves. Messages are sent through your spinal cord, and your brain says, danger, 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 stop right there. But then chronic pain surpasses that acuity. So after you get burned, your skin and your nerves and your blood vessels, all of that heal. The inflammation resolves. In chronic pain, there is no more healing. And the inflammation continues and your pain and your nervous system continuously um, actually perceive the sensation of pain after the injury has already healed. So is pain a friend or a foe? It could be both, right? Because it's a natural alarm, it tells you when your body is in danger, um, it tells you when you, know, you have an injury or a surgery, um, tells you that you need healing or if it's a cut or if there's an infection. Um, but then of course, we definitely don't want to be pain-free or painless because Children with these congenital diseases, like congenital insensitivity to pain and hereditary motor and sensory neuropathy, can't feel at pain at all. And so their childhood really, um, if not in a bubble, leads to many self-destructive and self-destructive um, uh, occurrences. And so, you know, they get burned, they cut themselves, and they bleed. So pain is definitely good in an acute setting. So ER visits, the ER is probably populated by 70 to 80 percent of people with pain, chest pain, abdominal pain, headaches, back pain, or accident or injury related pain. But then you have your private practices or your uh, family physicians or your internist who are also being populated with patients with chronic pain. And those settings can be due to fibromyalgia, uh, arthritis, immune disorders, migraines, and, and chronic back pain. And so it becomes a challenge for the physician to treat um, chronic pain because we don't necessarily have time to sit there and talk to you about everything that could be causing you this pain, right? Because we're so busy. And so um, we try to medicate ourselves or medicate our patients with non-steroidals, which are called Advil or Motrin, steroids, um, many people get steroid shots or injections in their hips and their joints to decrease localized inflammation. Tylenol and narcotics, uh, unfortunately, are overprescribed, uh, causing significant side effects and dependency on them. Muscle relaxers and antidepressants in some settings. 
So are we really treating the patient or are we treating their illness? I love this quote by Sir William Osler that says, the good physician treats the disease, but the great physician treats the patient who has the disease. And so every single one of you are a unique individual. And although it may seem to everyone around you that back pain is back pain, and so patient A and patient X should be treated with the same medication in the same fashion, your life and your health is totally different. And you should actually be treated differently and holistically. And so my hope today is that we'll talk about chronic pain. We all know what migraines are. And my hope is that this can give you a little bit of an insight to start asking questions about your health, to start asking questions, where is the root of the pain coming from, and trying to find out someone who will work with you. So chronic pain persists when the nervous system continues to be inflamed whether it's after an injury or in the absence thereof. There are certain things that can actually make your um, chronic pain worse. And as a physician or as a patient, you should probably know about it. Like if you have depression or anxiety, your pain will be resistant and you can't heal. If you, if you have poor sleep because of your pain, and you're tossing and turning all night long, well, that lack of sleep, that lack of rest, it's blocking the process of healing. And so it's a domino effect. So we really need to start looking at the different, um, the different aspects of chronic pain. And so in this um, slide here, it just kind of goes to show you how anxiety can arouse your pain perception and that gives you a sense of anxiety of when is my pain going to happen again and then you have the sense of PTSD you start to relive the experience of pain which evokes pain and then you of course ask for uh, pain medications which actually can feed into the cycle and make you more uh, pain sensitive one thing that I'd like to um, highlight today is that chronic pain has underlining inflammatory pathway. And this is not something that many practitioners today will focus about. They will try to find a lab value. They will try to find an x-ray or an MRI or a structural reason for your pain. But when your x-rays are normal, when your labs are normal, and you're still complaining of pain, they're at a loss. And they really can't go further than the medications that we've talked about. But is that the end of the road? I hope not. And my answer to you is no, it's not. So our bodies are bombarded by inflammatory substances all day long. You know, it's in our diet, it's in our environment, we're inhaling it from our carpets, we're inhaling it from our furniture, from the cleaning products that we use, of course, from, you know, the scents that we, we use on our bodies. Um, all of these are chemicals that our bodies are absorbing, and they're oxidants, and our bodies are trying to neutralize and produce antioxidants. Um, if our gut flora, which we focused on yesterday, is not balanced and we have an irregular imbalance of our microbes, then our gut is inflamed because it's bombarded with foreign and an imbalance of gut flora. If we are constantly stressed, if we constantly have things to worry about, we're not going to rest well we are not going to eat well and definitely not have energy to exercise. So we are going to be in a toxic overload. When our powerhouse called mitochondria, when our little power plants in our body get overloaded with all of these inflammatory toxins, 
they shut down. And when your powerhouses shut down, you lose the energy to heal, you lose the energy to overcome, and then that worsens the toxic load. And you become sensitive to pain, to where now you're feeling pain even when there is no injury around, and even your body starts to create pain for you in the, in the form of autoimmune disorders. Autoimmune disorders are your body, it's your body attacking itself. So your body is now creating pain for you. And that's not what your body is meant to do. Everything from your circulatory system, the way your gut is uh, compartmentalized, the way your brain is separated from the rest of your body, your body is meant to be a fighter. And so the whole process of healing and getting over pain is helping your body to fight and heal itself. So let's go over some uh, common causes of headaches. Um, headaches are major um, sources of pain for many of us. Of course, as a medical physician, some of the first things that I tend to ask are a history of sinus allergies, a history of mandibular um, joint problems and inflammation, uh, possible visual disturbances, changes in their vision, um, signs and symptoms of aneurysms, stroke, maybe an infection of the brain, um, and of course, we look at your blood pressure, making sure that your blood pressure isn't high and elevated and causing stress and inflammation. And of course, there are other causes like muscle tension. You know, there are so many people that come to me with headache that say they don't have any problems, but then as soon as I touch their neck, they nearly jump off the um, table in pain because their neck muscles are so tense. And why are our necks so tense? Because of our posture, because of our desk jobs, because of our you know, affinity to look at our, um, eye, on our electronic devices, um, you know, so many Im irregular and improper ways of lifting and working, um, and not enough time to relax, and not enough time to exercise. So exercise is a very good way to release muscle tension. Stretching is too. Other causes of headaches could be a spinal injury, uh, a concussion or sports-related head injury, um, some metabolic disorders like thyroid, diabetes, and of course, you have to be ask, the, um, ask yourself, am I taking Advil or Tylenol or aspirin on a regular basis? That could possibly be the cause of my headache. Let me look on my medication side effect. Let's look at the list that's, you know, this long. This could be the cause of my headache. Migraines are a little bit more complex because they are more debilitating uh, and the treatment is a little bit different. A migraine is a um, headache that occurs as a throbbing pain that pulses on usually one side of your head. Usually you have nausea, um, you have some vomiting, but you could just have a debilitating migraine that sends you to the bed, turn the light off, and you can't move. Other signs of possible migraine are seeing lights, um, having auditory or hearing different sounds. Um, you could even have partial blindness in your eye with a migraine, which is a little scary. Then I do recommend seeing a physician for that. Um, and sometimes migraines can be so debilitating that they can last for um, you know, the entire day or even weeks. So the causes of migraines. Um, some of the uh, reasons that I just mentioned to you before can be some causes for migraines. But like I said, I want to focus on things that cause inflammation because that's something that we don't normally hear about when we see our provider. And that is the causes of inflammation. Well, what can cause inflammation in your body? Well, look at the word migraines. What word do you see in there? The word grain. So in patients with migraines, food sensitivities 
especially to grain, needs to be addressed. Um, dairy and eggs are very often associated with triggering migraines and migraineurs, um, as well as, unfortunately, some other forms of foods and vegetables. Peanuts are highly inflammatory. Um, peanuts contain a um, fungus called aflatoxin. And so in the processing of peanuts into peanut butter, um, a lot of thought uh, has to go into making sure that the peanut butter is not infected. And so you really need to be, if you have migraines, you need to kind of stay away from this and eliminate these for at least four to eight weeks. Vitamin and mineral deficiencies are very common, especially um, vitamin D and magnesium. Um, and of course, there are other foods, um, hormones, and poor sleep and muscle tension that can be related to migraines. So what is the migraine treatment? You really need to support every part of your body and healing process. So you need to support what is in, infested with um, an overload. Your gut, your liver, your, your mind, and your adrenal glands. So a migraine diet, if you actually look at it, is almost similar to a weight loss diet, a diabetic diet, and an arthritis diet. So I tell all my diabetics that technically we all should eat like you because we should all focus on vegetables, fruits, nuts, seeds, berries, lean protein, plant-based, of course, and we should minimize our intake of gluten and focus on some really good um, low gluten um, grains called buckwheat, brown rice, wild rice, millet, and quinoa. Those are great sources of carbs, protein, and they have wonderful antioxidants. So definitely avoid processed foods because they contain all these food additives and preservatives. Nitrates especially are bad. MSG is terrible. Um, sulfites and refined sugars and excess carbohydrates. These are some of the supplements that you can focus on. Vitamin D. You know, if you have chronic inflammation and low vitamin D, definitely get on at least 4,000, if not 5,000 international units of vitamin D. Focus on plant-based omega-3 fatty acids, which are very important for your nerves and your um, brain. Um, your gamma linoleic acid, all of these are found in flax seeds. Probiotics, um, if you really want to get rid of inflammation in your gut and in your body, please focus on probiotics with 50 billion um, international units. If you're having a probiotic with 10 or 5 or 8, you're probably not going to get as much bang for your buck. And magnesium, which helps to relax your muscles and helps to support healing of your nerves. Here are some botanical um, plans that the American Academy of Neurology and uh, scientific studies have shown to help, but they are not actually in mainstay um, treatment because the FDA um, hasn't really felt comfortable in a certain particular company in producing this and following the side effects that could be possible. But ginger obviously is free to all. It's in um, most grocery stores. Feverfew is a plant that is used for migraines. It can be used for stomach aches, for arthritis and uh, chronic allergies. It can also help to reduce a fever, so it's highly anti-inflammatory. And the combination of ginger and feverfew has been shown to reduce migraines by 65%. Um, Butterbur is a very interesting, it's um, most effective at, at 75 milligrams twice a day when you're having a headache and it has a pretty good reduction of pain with 45%. And what I thought was interesting is that the Academy of Neurology in the States has established that it is an effective migraine therapy but they won't approve it because of the possibility of liver disease. But how many medications don't have that possibility? I mean, most cholesterol medications cause that. 
um, some um, antidepressants cause that. I mean, liver disease can be a risk for most medications, but of course, it's not um, approved yet, but it is still available for us if we need it. I do want to warn you that if you think it's just a headache, um, don't try to treat yourself if you have these symptoms. If your headaches change, if you're used to having mild headaches, but this is just a little different, it's lasting a little bit longer, um, it's a lot stronger, I want you to go for help. If you have a sudden onset of thunderclap headache, please get help, go to the emergency room. If you have a headache with fever, a stiff, a stiff neck, neck, if you have some mental confusion, lethargy, double vision, weakness, if you have numbness or trouble speaking, please seek an emergency room right away. Don't try to use any kind of herbs at home. If you have headache after a head injury, especially um, accident, a motor vehicle, or a sports related, please call for help because these are all signs of infections, strokes, aneurysms, and possible um, mass occupying lesions. Let's go ahead and talk about back pain. Most of us have had some sort of back pain before. Um, it's usually in the lower back, but it can affect us in the middle back. Most um, common causes are a muscle sprain. Um, so you're straining your muscle or there's been poor um, blood oxygenation to your back, either due to poor posture while sleeping or sitting or um, poor um, you know, lifting techniques. All of these are very important, so you should make sure that you learn some good techniques. Um, other non-neurological uh, causes are um, increased abdominal fat or a beer belly for some. So that increased pressure around the gut can press against your spine and can actually um, precipitate uh, back pain. And um, then we deal with a little bit more complex neurological causes of back pain. Um, and these are related to your nerves and your spine and your brain. But what else can cause back pain? Have you ever thought that possibly constipation can cause back pain? Sounds kind of funny, right? What does that have to do with our back? Um, well, an excess or accumulation of constipation. What is, what is constipation? Most of my patients seem very confused. Um, they tell me that they have a bowel movement once a week, but that they're not constipated. Constipation, I guess, has different terms, but this is kind of the gist. If you are having difficulty passing stool, if it's very painful that you have to strain, you're constipated. If you have infrequent bowel movements one, two, three times a week or twice a month, um, that is definitely constipation. But how about if you have a bowel movement, one bowel movement every day? Is that constipation? What if you have loose stool three times a day? Is that constipation? You know, you can actually have constipation and have a bowel movement once a day and have loose stool several times a day. And when we do an x-ray on your abdomen, your abdomen, your intestines will be packed with stool. So the fact that you're having one bowel movement or two bowel movements or several loose bowel movements a day does not negate the fact that you could be constipated. And this is what happens when you're constipated. The diameter of your intestine starts to expand, right? It's like a balloon. You just keep stuffing the balloon with sand and it starts to expand. Now, remember, some of you were here last night and we talked about how our intestines are lined and intertwined with nerve endings and these nerve endings are connected to our spine. Now when our intestines are distended and stretched, these nerve endings likewise are distended and stretched and this feeds into the spinal cord the sensation of pain that your brain now is perceiving as back pain. But it's actually derived from constipation. 
So, the back door to back pain. Fecal impaction can press on the sacral nerve. And a lot of my patients come with sciatica. You know, they say, Doc, my sciatic nerve is acting up. Well, what'd you do? Did you lift something? Did you push something? Did you exercise? Do you remember doing anything? No. So they don't remember any acute injury, but now all of a sudden, their sciatica is flared up. Well, guess what? The sciatic nerve is actually located and it is innervated by the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve is that long nerve, remember that we kind of learned about last night, that is the communication highway between the brain and the gut. And so when there is gut inflammation due to distension and dilation and fecal impaction, the vagus nerve is stimulated, inflammation is triggered, and of course that it presses on your sciatic nerve. And interestingly enough, a study has statistically linked hemorrhoids and sciatica together. And what's the common link? What can cause both? Constipation. Hemorrhoids is a sign of constipation. Hemorrhoids are simply an enlargement of your um, rectal veins. And because of the fecal impaction and accumulation, it's pressing and causing volume. And so your uh, veins are expanding, causing hemorrhoids. So how can we treat this back pain in an unorthodox manner? Well, first of all, if you have back pain and you've not had an injury, try this. Get addicted to water. Drink lots of water because you really need to start pushing your fluids because fluids are, water is lubricating. It lubricates your joints and it also lubricates your gut. So drink tons of water. The recommendations are half your body weight in ounces of water. Um, however, if you only drink one bottle or two bottles a day, I say start slow. Try to drink two and a half. Increase to three slowly. This kind of helps you not to feel like you're drowning yourself. Increase your fiber, plant-based, through fruits and vegetables. Uh, stay active because motion is lotion and so the more you move, the more you activate your gut, um, especially after meals. If you can, I know it's hard when you're at your job, after eating would be the best time to take a nice walk. 10 minutes, 15 minutes of a brisk, nice walk rather than just sitting back at your desk. This movement actually stimulates digestion it actually activates blood flow, and so you have really good digestion and you're able to absorb nutrients. And also, um, activity is good for your bowel movements. How about musculoskeletal manipulation? You know, some of us um, have pain in certain areas of our body and we're afraid of touching that area because we feel like we're going to cause a little bit more pain. Well, that's true. If you have a tender back and you put a little pressure on it, you know, it might feel uncomfortable. Back off a little bit. Don't put so much pressure, but just a little pressure will start to actually activate some blood flow and decrease the muscle tension there. So a little bit of um, musculoskeletal manipulation that you can do at home. Um, this is uh, trigger points with golf balls. So you can take golf balls and you can roll them um, over your muscles. You can find your um, painful trigger point in the back or your neck and you can stand against a wall and you can roll that golf ball. I find it easier to use a softball. It's a little bit larger um, than a golf ball. Um, and just put a little bit of pressure there and you start to um, notice almost immediately that you have a little bit of um, pressure release. So things that you can do at home, in the comfort of your own home, you don't have to go to the emergency room, you probably don't have to go, you know, stand in a long line, 
These are things that you can start off with at home. And last but not least, call Rotor Rooter. Um, you know, if you feel like you have back pain and there's no injury and there's no muscle tension, try the backdoor approach. Try a colon irrigation. Eliminate that intestinal congestion. Or better yet, do a whole body detox. You know, clean the fat from your liver. Get all those chemicals and um, free radicals out from your body. Go ahead and get rid of all the oxidation that can cause inflammation. You know, and honestly, um, colon irrigation and cleansing can sometimes be controversial in the medical community. Um, most doctors will say, no, you don't need that because your body can get rid of toxins on their own. Well, that's true when it's not inundated and overflowing with toxins. But once the toxin level is just above and beyond, your body just gives. Like I said, your powerhouses, your mitochondria turn off and give up. And so you need help. And in medicine, we do aggressive treatment and detoxes all the time. I don't know if you know anybody on dialysis, but dialysis is simply detoxifying and clearing up the blood because the kidneys are unable to. Um, you know, having a cardiac bypass, it's an aggressive way to eliminate and clean clogged arteries. So, you know, in medicine we do do aggressive cleaning and detoxing, but again, because a colon irrigation is not in men's mainstream medicine, it's not as recommended. <clears throat> well, let's talk a little bit about um, a different form of chronic pain that can also be related to inflammation, and that is fibromyalgia. Fibromyalgia has been thought to be a made-up illness for many years. Um, why? Because there was no lab test that can prove that you had fibromyalgia. <clears throat> You know, all your lab work is normal, all your x-rays are normal, but yet you're complaining of chronic pain. <clears throat> there was no cause. So for many years, we thought that this was a made-up illness. Um, fibromyalgia, for some of you who don't know what it is, um, it is specific pain in um, these multiple trigger points. And in order to be diagnosed with fibromyalgia, you um, technically are tested if you have trigger point tenderness in all of these spaces uh, on the neck, around the shoulder and shoulder blades, around the um, hip area, the sciatic um, area, and around the knee. And these are very specific point tenderness. Many fibromyalgia patients also have fatigue and depression and insomnia and brain fog. So it's not just that they have chronic pain. So this means that your whole body is being affected. This is not just a muscle issue. This is an entire body inflammation and problem. And again, in mainstay treatment, we just treat the muscle pain. But in integrative treatments, you want to take a look at the entire patient. They're having brain fog. You know, we, we have to address all the issues and not just one. So uh, some of the things that can actually cause fibromyalgia, like we talked before, toxic metabolic um, buildup through your diet, through constipation and liver toxicity. Um, it's interesting that you can actually see these metabolic um, toxins in these patients' muscles. If you look um, under the microscope, whenever there is toxic buildup, our muscles start to degrade and they start to uh, lose elasticity in the shape and the structure. And in fibromyalgia patients, these structural changes are evident. And so, <clears throat> again, this is an evidence that this is not just a made-up illness. This is actually something that's attacking your muscles. <clears throat> um, other things that can be related um, to fibromyalgia is the small intestinal bowel overgrowth. So having, <clears throat> excuse me, having um, more bacteria in your small intestine, all of that is a sign um, that there is an inflammation in your gut 
that now is starting to seep into your muscles and you are having fibromyalgia pay, um, pain all over. Mainstay treatment for fibromyalgia, pain medications, um, we use antidepressants um, because of course many fibromyalgia patients have depression, uh, but it also can help with pain. Um, sometimes it's psychotherapy, so going to um, a psychologist, learning how to deal with pain, um, learning how to cope with different mechanisms, and of course we also recommend exercise. But all of this can just do so much. Um, rather than just accepting the fact that you are doomed to a life of chronic pain in your, you know, 30s, and what I failed to mention is that fibromyalgia is diagnosed usually between your 20s and your 50s. Very rarely do you start diagnosing a new fibromyalgia patient in their 50s and 60s. So, I mean, think about it. If you're in your 30s and you are diagnosed with fibromyalgia, you are looking at a very long life of chronic pain, and it doesn't have to be so. I'm not guaranteeing that with these treatments um, you will never have pain again, but it will definitely be effective if you stick with it. So you definitely need a toxic detox. Cleaning your liver, cleaning your intestines, and just go ahead and start an overall waste removal. Support your powerhouses and your adrenal glands. And here are you know, just a few things that you can do to kind of help and support your um, road to an anti-inflammatory healing method where you're not ignoring the cause and the root but you are actually addressing it head on. Now some of us have pain from um, entrapment of nerves. Um, it could be uh, entrapment of your um, muscle because of muscles, because of bony deformities. Um, sometimes you know you can have nerve sensitivity because of a temperature change. Um, so in these situations, you should avoid direct contact with chilling uh, temperature, like a, a vent. Uh, most people you know sleep with a fan on and that really cools off their uh, muscles that causes a muscular contraction and it also contracts around the nerves that can cause um, nerve sensitivity lack of exercise um, which leads to a decrease of oxygenation around the nerve uh, chronic state of um, stress of um, emotional disturbance and a lack of vitamin, uh, vitamins like B12 and sometimes an elevation in your glucose which can cause um, some peripheral nerve damage. Another very common source and cause of pain is arthritis. Now there are two different types of arthritis. One is an autoimmune problem and one is a osteoarthritis that is kind of a wear and tear plus inflammation. 23 million worldwide live with rheumatoid arthritis, about 300,000 in Canada. So it's very important to know what type of arthritis you have because they're treated differently, they progress differently, and they are associated with different other comorbidities or other illnesses. But the root of cause in integrative medicine for arthritis is inflammation. In an autoimmune setting, the inflammation has burdened your immune system so much that now your immune system is overactive, overvigilant, can't shut off, doesn't know what is foreign, what is real, and it starts to attack your own body. In the case of arthritis, it attacks the synovial fluid between your joints. Therefore, you have no lubrication between your joints, and now they start to grind and cause inflammation. The damage is due to oxidative stress that is built up. Your body is unable to produce enough antioxidants, and it is basically um, overburdened. In osteoarthritis, very common in aging population, um, 40s, 50s, 60s, but still associated with a systemic inflammation. Osteoarthritis doesn't really necessarily follow the pattern of wear and tear like we used to think. Some, some triggers for osteoarthritis, which is your common day arthritis, 
is metabolic syndrome, where you have elevated sugar in your body, which causes inflammation, um, or elevated cholesterol, if you have excess fat around the abdomen, and if you have an imbalance of gut flora. So oxidative stress needs to be neutralized. We basically need to avoid your dietary preservatives and chemicals, environmental toxins, um, medication toxicity. We need to avoid, you know, if you've had a chronic illnesses and infections back to back to back, especially, you know, monovirus, um, there are some in intestinal viruses that can cause havoc on your immune system. All of that, your body needs a detox, and all of that burden needs to be cleaned up. And what's the uh, result of this oxidative stress on your bones? Your bones are going to um, degrade. The treatment for this oxidative stress um, is focus on your gut health again. Be proactive. Treat your friendly gut with tender love and care. Eat a high antioxidant diet. How do you do that? There are some concentrated antioxidant supplements like spirulina and chlorella. Um, these are, they are high in so many vitamins and minerals that support your mitochondria, which are the powerhouses of your body. And of course, some other anti-inflammatory um, herbs such as turmeric and ginger are very good when combined with a holistic approach. Now, some people just want to stick to the supplements. But if you think about it, if your gut is inflamed, will you absorb those supplements? Will they really be effective? So start with your gut, and then let your body start healing naturally, and let your body heal in a friendly environment, and you will definitely thrive, um, and hopefully, your pain will not last. I can't guarantee you won't cut yourself. Uh, you, can't, you won't bump yourself. Uh, you won't experience some few bruises here and there. But if you, if you have a headache, don't just pop a pill the next time. Try to think, have I been drinking my water? You know, when's the last time I drank water? Okay, let's drink a bottle of water. Okay, my headache is still there. Let's drink another bottle. Okay, what did I last eat? You know, did I eat something wrong? Did I maybe disrupt something in my intestine? Or you can start thinking about your muscles and overall. So get to know your body. Nobody else will know your body better than you. And I want you to actually take charge of your health and um, be wise in what goes in your body to treat it. Thank you very much.